Well, thank you all again for coming today and joining us for today's conversation. My name is Megan Hennis. I'm the Visitor Services and Membership Coordinator here at the National Buffalo Museum. And today we are going to be discussing the different types of bison herds and how they are managed. So with further ado, I'd like to turn things over to Alana to get things started. Hi everybody, welcome. And thanks again, Megan. Um, welcome again to Bison After Breakfast. This is our second go round at this. We're glad to have you all here. And I was scrolling through the panelists. I see a few people I know. There is Dick, Craig Hoffman, Danny, hi, um, Eric Holland, hi, my mom, hi mom, uh, Jim Matheson and Linda, hi, and I think Susie, hey, those are people I know, so I'm really glad to see you guys and uh, meet some new people today. My name is Alana Zenos. I'm the executive director at the National Buffalo Museum. The museum is a nonprofit that was founded in 1991, and our mission is to advocate for the restoration of the North American bison through education and outreach. Um, like a lot of businesses around due to COVID, we have been closed to the public, but we are thrilled to be able to connect with you all here. Um, the temporary closure has meant that our revenue stream is pretty minimal right now. So if you are able to support us financially um, with a big or a small amount, um, or if you would like to shop on our online store, which also helps to support us, um, you can find chats, uh, links in the chat box to both of those um, things, either a donation or looking at our store. And I can tell you, I'm, I'm excited to say that we have over 300 um, products online on our store right now. And we offer uh, gift wrapping. Um, so anyways, thank you so much. Uh, I wanted to introduce our staff once again. Um, you met Megan Hennis, Visitor Services and Membership Coordinator. Uh, Rachel Johnson's also here. She's doing the back end of things. She is monitoring the chat. She's helping us with logistics. Um, she's our curator of collections and um, she's with us today. So, Bison After Breakfast is a bi-weekly, one hour long um, virtual program that explores all things bison. Last week, we talked about the impact of um, COVID-19 on the bison business. You can find the recording on YouTube, on our website, through Facebook, we have put it everywhere. Um, and then Rachel's gonna put a link to that, um, that video in the chat as well. Right now, um, I'm gonna just get started by introducing our panelists. I am thrilled to have these panelists here today. First is Donald Beard. He is the herd manager at Calf Rock State Park in Briscoe County, West Texas. Um, let's see, are we seeing them guys yet? Or are we going to be seeing them? I don't, I'm not sure how we're doing this, but you'll see him soon. Um, Dr. Brendan Moynihan is a research coordinator and science advisor for the National Park Service. And he is also the chair of the Department of the Interior's Bison Working Group. Next, we have Dave Carter. Um, he is the executive director for the National Bison Association. Carissa Bussey is the Western South Dakota Conservation Manager for the Nature Conservancy. And then Megan Davenport with her Fancy virtual background or something is the wildlife biologist at the Intertribal um, Buffalo Council. So, oh good, I see you all now. So yeah. before we get started on our topic today, uh, it's possible because this is, um, we're kind of new to public programming. So we thought it was possible that some of you guys out there aren't familiar with the organizations that our speakers work for and represent. I'm going to ask each of them to introduce their organizations just real quick so we can get an idea of why we've invited them to be here today. And I'm going to start with Donald. So thanks for having me today, Alana. It's, it's, it's a pretty neat concept that you've got going here. I'm looking forward to participating. As, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm with Caprock Canyon State Park. I'm the park superintendent and state uh, park police officer. Uh, we have about 12,000 acres and about 250 bison that, that range here at the park. They're the last known example of the Southern Plains herd of bison. They're pretty special animals and we're, we're pretty excited to be able to take care of them for the great state of Texas. Great, thank you. So let's go to Dave Carter. I know you've always got good stuff to say, Dave. 
<laughs> well, Dave Carter, I'm the executive director of the National Bison Association. Uh, we represent about 1,200 uh, ranchers and marketers, uh, bison enthusiasts in 48 states and 10 foreign countries. Um, <clears throat> we've been around since 1994, and we're essentially a merger between two previous associations that started back in the late 60s. But uh, we serve as a national voice for the bison industry. We advocate for public policy. Uh, we do a lot of promotion of bison products and outreach to uh, producers to help them increase their ability to manage their herds and, and maintain herd health and get new people into the business. Awesome. Okay, thanks. Um, Carissa, you're up. Hey, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Great, thanks. So my name is Carissa, and thank you again for the invitation to join you this morning. This is an exciting panel. You are welcome. Uh, I work with the Nature Conservancy, and we are a nonprofit conservation organization. We actually operate all around the world, but here in North America, we have 12 different bison herds that we manage and operate on our preserves across the Great Plains. So we have herds as far north as North Dakota and as far south as Oklahoma, as far west as Colorado and east as Indiana. And all of those herd managers, uh, with the exception of one in Colorado, use prescribed fire as well in how we manage our herds and how we move our animals. So that's maybe one other item we could talk about more today. Um, and I think I'll pause there. Awesome, okay. So let's go to Megan Davenport. Hi, can you guys hear me all right? Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm the wildlife biologist for Intertribal Buffalo Council. Um, Intertribal Buffalo Council is a federally chartered tribal organization. We have a membership of 69 nations that are all um, focused on restoring buffalo herds to tribal lands. Awesome, I was trying to unmute myself, unmute myself. Brendan, <laughs> you wanna try again? Back, yeah, forgive me for the technical difficulties. No, we're all doing this. This is what it's all about. We're yeah. hoping that other people will be like, hey, we can do a webinar, this is great, look at them. That's right, <laughs> and, in the, in the, and in the spirit of remote working, you may hear, kids coming and going as they're homeschooling or a dog barking here and there, but no um, worries. my name is Brendan Moynihan. I work for the National Park Service. Um, I, I work in a partnership program called the Cooperative Ecosystem Studies Unit, which delivers technical expertise and uh, education and, uh, and research projects to national parks. Um, and I'm a science advisor in that capacity, but I also work um, for the NPS on a group called the Department of Interior Bison Working Group, which has been around for about 15 years or so. And, uh, and is a collection of representatives from the Park Service, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, the BLM, Bureau of Land Management, uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and the US Geological Survey. So all the agencies that have a, a hand in either bison management or uh, bison re research. And, um, uh, so I'm, I'm the chair of that group, and I'll talk a little bit about um, both bison management from the perspective of the National Park Service, but also some of the things that we're working on um, in a coordinated fashion from uh, the Department of Interior level. Awesome. That is really great. Thank you guys again. Um, we are really glad to have you all here with us today. I mean, we've got like a stellar group of um, panelists. Um, we've called today's presentation Bison Beyond Yellowstone because we, I mean, I found actually in just the work I do that when you talk with just the general public and you talk about bison, they, they come up with this idea that, right, bison are at Yellowstone, right? But really, um, only a fraction of the bison in North America live or are a part of the Yellowstone herd. Um, we invited each of you here today to talk about the different types of bison herds and, and the differences and similarities in how those herds are managed. Because also, I don't think the general public has an idea that bison herds can be and are managed because if, if you think about it, you know, they're still thinking about, a lot of people still think about bison, Yellowstone, sort of this open-ended free uh, roaming species. So, um, I guess let, we'll go to Brendan first since he was last, last time. And um, as we compare bison herds and management at Yellowstone with management at other locations, 
I wonder if, since you work for the National Park Service, you could talk about how the Yellowstone herd is managed and um, just sort of touch on what their carrying capacity is, how, how you guys decide how big that herd actually can be and, and things like that. Yeah, you bet. So uh, Yellowstone is, as you say, Alana, is, a, is, a, is what comes to mind for a lot of the American public when we think of wild bison in North America. Um, Yellowstone bison are managed under um, a very complex, um, thoroughly negotiated multi-partner plan called the Interagency Bison Management Plan. And uh, that plan was uh, 10 years in the making and then finally signed in the year 2000. So it's been in place for about 20 years now. And the principal partners to that plan are the National Park Service, of course, um, also the U.S. Department of Agriculture, um, a, a group called APHIS, which is the Animal Plant and Health Inspection Service. And that's a group that's really focused on uh, wildlife health and the linkage of wildlife and wild plants to um, uh, economic interests, largely, and, and, and private concerns. Um, also, the state of Montana, both the Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, but also the Department of Livestock. And then there are several tribal partners to that group as well. So um, the Confederate, Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes, which are, um, uh, which are based in the Flathead Reservation north of Missoula here in Montana. Um, also the Nez Perce tribe and also the Intertribal uh, Buffalo Council, which, which Megan is a, a representative for. So um, the plan's very complex. It's been in place for about 20 years. Um, and essentially it's a process for managing the fact that bison in Yellowstone reside in Yellowstone most of the year, but uh, in most years when pushed by winter conditions and deep snow and cold, they migrate to lower elevations, which has some of them, uh, a different amount each year, depending upon conditions, come out of the park boundary and onto either private or uh, forest service or state lands outside of the park uh, boundary. So um, at that point, the bison are subject to a different management world and management scenario altogether. So that's, that's how those bison are managed. Generally, there's a, a, a rough target of about 4,000 animals for the bison herd in Yellowstone um, for both the northern and southern herds. And um, the, th that is set based on, um, it's, it's, a, it's a number that's set based on what the park believes is a, a suitable number for ecological diversity and sustainability of that particular herd. But it's also balanced with the, the fact that there's, um, there's gotta be consideration for tolerance of bison moving outside of the park. And, um, and that's where the plan comes in. So it's a really complicated world. And, and, um, and even though I would say um, Yellowstone has a, a unique management situation in that regard, um, the Department of Interior agencies manage uh, 18 other bison herds across 12 states in the United States. And each of those has its own set of unique considerations and constraints. So um, that, that's, that's the general backdrop of, of Yellowstone. Um, there's a related quarantine program that I'll mention. One of the concerns about Yellowstone bison for, for quite a few people is the fact that Yellowstone carry a uh, bacteria that can cause a disease is called brucella. The disease is brucellosis. And this is a, um, it's a bacteria that originally, many, many decades ago, was transmitted from livestock, from cattle to bison. And then um, producers in Montana were really successful with eradicating brucellosis in, in commercial uh, cattle herds in Montana. Um, the bison still retain that, that disease. And there's concern now about the potential impact if bison were to transmit that disease to cattle. Um, it, it, it could have a big impact on a, a huge part of the Montana economy being, being livestock operations. Um, so to, to ease those concerns, even though we, there's not been a documented case of brucellosis transmission from bison to cattle, um, one of the things that Yellowstone is involved in with a number of partners is a quarantine program. So bison that migrate out of the park in the wintertime are, um, are subject, some of them are subject to hunting by state permitted hunters in Montana or by tribal harvest through uh, treaty rights that go back to the mid and late 1800s. 
Um, but a number of them are captured by the National Park Service and, and go into a, a quarantine program. Any bison that, um, that test positive for brucellosis are uh, sent to, uh, to slaughter and, and those animals are generally um, um, removed immediately in that regard to ease those, those concerns. Um, but animals that test negative go into a multi-year process where um, we continually test and evaluate um, the reliability of test results and animals that are certified as being brucellosis free are then available to be shipped to a, um, a facility that is managed by the Fort Peck tribes in Montana. Um, so, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, so what happens is, I guess to sort of, I'm gonna, give you my lay person's version yeah, of please. Yellowstone. Tell me if I'm wrong. You guys in Yellowstone, bison aren't really, they're, they're not managed really like livestock because is there a roundup or anything like that? They're, they're considered just wildlife and, and right. they can do what they want to do. Absolutely. And then when you have to, when they go off the grounds or you have to sort of round them up, I mean, there's a culling process, I would guess, because you you only have enough land for so many animals, correct? Yeah, so there is there is a target for removal, um, and and we you know the, the goal is to keep it right about four thousand animals, and so uh -huh. um, so so yeah the, the, the even though um, when we talk about carrying capacity, we often think of what an ecological carrying capacity is. How much how many animals can a um, of a specific species can a, can a landscape or a or a certain area support? Um, most that's a good actually that's a really good definition because I mean we're talking to people here who may not even understand what carrying capacity is yeah. so I mean just to just to say again like I mean this means like how how much land can be sustained by the animal and since they just eat what's off the land right is there enough forage for them um, so that's how you guys determine that correct yeah, exactly. So when we when we um, when we are, are trained in wildlife biology or or, or um, livestock operations and management, we we think often about ecological carrying capacity, which which really is kind of um, it, it's uh, it's it, it in the real world it kind of approaches kind of a theoretical type of uh, of concept, meaning that um, uh, ecological carrying capacity refers to the number, in, in the case of bison, the number of animals a particular land area can support given um, you know, range condition, productivity, water, um, predators, um, hunting, all that sort of thing. And, but in reality, we, have, we typically impose a management target or carrying capacity that's well below that. Um, right, right. Okay, awesome, thank you. I mean, that was really like, I, I learned stuff. <laughs> so now we're going to go to Dave Carter because we talked about Yellowstone. We've, we've talked a lot about Yellowstone bison and now um, the national park system. But Dave, can you just tell us where do all the bison live? <laughs> well, they live everywhere. Uh, people don't realize that there are bison in every state of the United States. There's a couple of herds in Hawaii, and I've been visiting with one of our members that has a herd out on Long Island this past week. And, um, you know, when you think about it historically, this animal went all the way from the Yukon Flats down to northern Mexico, uh, even though it's most big charge and it's most closely associated with Great Plains. And today, uh, we're up to close to 400,000 bison being restored in North America, which is a remarkable story of restoration because in about 1885 we were down to about 700 to 750 animals left alive. And when you think about it, uh, bison really represent the greatest uh, story of market-based restoration in North America. I say that because, uh, you know, when we look around and I, I look at my fellow presenters here on the screen, you know, the private ranchers, uh, a big part of the, the National Bison Association, um, but the conservation community, the, the national parks, state parks, the nature conservancy, and tribal producers um, are all partners in bison restoration. 
But the fourth very, very important partner is that consumer, is the American public. Right. And we like to say that the more you enjoy the taste of bison and the more you incorporate it into your diet, the more you're providing incentives for us to bring more and more animals back to their, their native habitat. Um, the more you go to the parks and you enjoy visiting bison and seeing them, the more you're, you're providing an incentive to bring bison back to public lands. And the same with the tribal producers. So, um, you know, bison are everywhere. 90, over 90% of the bison are in on private lands. Um, but that's a good thing because more than 90% of the acreage that bison once rose is under private ownership. So, you know, it's appropriate that we bring bison back to, to ranches just as we bring them back to um, public lands and to tribal lands. Right. And I I think that an important thing that you said is about 90% of the bison live in private lands. Would you include, um, is that, do you have an idea of the breakdown of like how, where, like are they for-profit ranches? Do we know? Well, almost, you know, the majority of them are ranches that are, are profit. You know, that's why I say the, the consumer is so important uh, because- right. the, we want to be ecologically sustainable, but we have to be economically sustainable. And so as a rancher, if I'm not able to sell my calves or uh, you know, somebody able to sell the meat, then we can't sustain it. We have to move on and do something else with that land. But you know, it's, so, it's so diverse. And um, when you think about wildlife versus livestock, it's, it's really not an either or uh, continuum. There's, when you, when you think about how most bison are managed, first of all, it's very different from livestock. We don't castrate them. We don't dehorn them. Um, we don't use artificial insemination. You know, I think most ranchers have found through the years that the less we do, the better the bison do. And that's been a learning process. We have a series of books uh, or a series that we produce through the years. Uh, it's, it's called the Bison Producer's Handbook. And we just did the last one a couple years ago. And as we were preparing that, we had about 25 folks with all kinds of expertise and everything from finding the right animal to selling the meat. And as, as we were compiling that, I went back to, I think it was like 1986, when the first version, yes, love it, Megan, thank you. <laughs> the first version was produced and it was essentially an insert in, uh, in what is now bison world. And I was reading that through and I kind of chuckled to myself because I thought this should have been entitled everything I know about raising cattle. Um, because at that time it was folks coming into the business who had a, a strong background in the cattle business and it right. was just treat them like cattle. It's just bigger, higher fences and you know chase them around and everything. And over the years, we peeled back a lot of that and figured out, okay, this, yeah, this is what works from our knowledge with cattle, but this is something where this animal is so different. And so, right. you know, we always like to say that the bison teaches something new every day. I think that is really, um, that's really important. I think everybody on this panel would agree about that. And one thing um, before we move on, because I'm afraid, like there's so much to talk about today. I'm afraid we will run out of time on this one. Um, what I want to do is I want to let Donald, um, then Carissa talk about um, just their particular herds, how they're managed, um, any of their culling processes. Like how do they, how do you guys determine how many animals you keep? Um, Maybe how do you determine when it's time to which ones you let go? And um, are your are your herds um, are you do you treat them? I would guess you're going to treat them more like wildlife than livestock. But you tell me um, a little bit about that. I'm going to let Donald go and then Carissa because then I want to talk to Megan a bit and then swing back to Dave again if we have time about um, the different ways that different herds can be managed. Um, within the same sort of sector. So Perfect. Donald, yeah. would you, yeah. Uh, absolutely, you I'd like stuff. to talk about that. I'd like to back up a little bit and talk a little bit what, what Dave was saying, expand on that. So okay. I, I've, I've got a unique perspective here because I do, 
I am the superintendent here and I run the, the, the bison herd for the state of Texas, but I'm also a private producer. I have a herd of my own. Awesome. So I sit on, it, it's not, it's not a different side of the fence because we're all beginning this together, but, mm -hmm. but I, I, I see it from different angles. And, you and have it's two perspectives. Yes, absolutely. And, and what we have done in the National Bison Association is, is we are starting to do a, a bison uh, conservation plan to showcase what these private producers are doing because uh, there's, there's all different ways to, to raise bison and people do it different ways, but the majority of the people that you meet in the National Bison Sur uh, Association are conservationists. I mean, they're doing this because they love the animal. They want to conserve Absolutely. it. So, you know, the, the perspectives may be a little different and the reasons behind it may be a little different, but we're all in this together without a doubt. So yeah. as far as the park goes, we absolutely treat these guys like wildlife as much as we can. There will always be management. Every bison herd, even like Brandon, Brandon said, every bison herd is managed at some level without a doubt. We have to, I mean, and we probably always will just because of, of the situation we're in, in in our country. Uh, but we let them free range the, the majority of the part. We don't do any supplemental feeding. We don't, uh, we don't, we don't treat them like cattle. Uh, we do have a carrying capacity. There's a couple of different carrying capacities where there's a ecological carrying capacity where you talk about how much the land will sustain, but you also have to look at how much can society sustain as well. There's a social carrying capacity. You know, you get to a point where you have too many animals in this park and you mix them with 100,000 visitors a year and things, bad things start to happen. So that is we, super interesting. Yeah, yes. we, we manage our bison at a level where people can still see what, you know, this, this amazing animal, but they also are safe. They're taken care of. Safety is one of our utmost concerns without a doubt for the, for the visitor and staff and the animal. We have to take care of the animal as well. So we look at all that stuff when we're doing this and, and, and we, that's how we come up with our numbers that we, our target numbers. And then when we do have coal, and we're starting to get to that point now where we have coal. So. And can you tell my mom, I mean, I'm sorry. Can you tell, I'm teasing mom. Can you tell some of the, some of the audience who may not know, like, what is culling? I mean, we talk about these things like management, sure. livestock, yeah. and I don't right. know that everybody knows these things. I'm hoping yes. that you'll learn or ask questions, but yeah. Tell okay, so culling is, is when you take the animals uh, and you keep them at a level that, that is sustainable for, for whatever that purpose is. Now, our purpose is obviously to conserve these animals. And, and also to take care of the entire park. It's not, this park is not just for the bison. It's, it's the whole park. It's a holistic right. management without a doubt. Um, and, and man has been culling bison for thousands of years. Man has been managing bison for thousands of years. Matter of fact, inside this park, we have archeological evidence of man hunting bison for over 10,000 years. So yeah. it does, you know, we've always managed bison as long as bison and man have been together without a doubt. Absolutely. So we're still, we continue on that process. And when we do the culling, we look at the reproductive system as, as their indicator, okay? If a bison is healthy, if a bison's got all it needs to eat, and everything's good, it's going to be reproductive. And if it's not, there's something wrong. You have to look at the environment. Is, there, is it missing something dietary? Is, is something missing that's causing it not to be reproductive? But if all things are good, all things are equal, then those are the animals, if, if they're not reproducing, their lineage won't be passed down anyway. So those are the ones we start to look at for culling. We start to look at also our, our male to female ratio. You know, again, I mentioned the, the social caring capacity and bad things can happen. You get too many bulls in here and bad things will happen as well. Because yeah, they can are you very... talk about that? I mean, talk yeah. about that because uh, I, don't, I don't think people understand that one bull is going to father many many different babies right. in a they're, season. they're very they're very similar to deer in that respect they have a rut season and they have a breeding season and they actually will uh fight with each other and to figure out who is the dominant bulls those, those bulls will be the the breeding bulls for that year um so when you get a whole bunch of bulls and they're all equal you know they can fight we have had bulls that kill each other you know so but but when they're doing that, they also not paying attention which camper is next to them or which car is next to them or which fence is next to them. So 
you know, right. things can happen if we're not careful. So we try and keep that capacity where as close to nature as possible, but still uh, keep the safety part of it in, in, in check. So that's our culling regime there. It's, it's based on reproductive abilities and it's also based upon uh, the, the male to female relationship. We do no culling based upon any looks, any, anything as far as confirmation or, or anything that has to do with how the bison looks, big horns, little horns, you know, fuzzy, not fuzzy. We stay away from that because that's not, that's not the business we're in. That, that's you a don't body stuff. shame those bison. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so confirmation is the physical, how the body looks, right? The physical yes, right. health. Right. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, we try to keep it as natural as we possibly can. Yeah. We yeah. welcome all shapes and sizes. Just produce, please. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. Well, thanks. Um, I'm going to give Carissa a, a go at this because, gosh, there was so much I want to get through today. You're all coming back. Okay, Carissa. <laughs> um, I guess I want to talk a little bit about for the management, how do we determine how many animals and how do we call? One of the reasons that the Nature Conservancy first started bringing bison onto our preserves was because we wanted to use the bison to help us restore the prairie. So we're actually restoring bison to the landscape. And in doing so, we're also helping restore the lands that those bison used to graze on hundred years ago or more. Carissa, and can you can you quickly say, because I know that the bison is a keystone species to the prairie ecology. That's like one of my big things. But for those people who don't know, can you kind of just really quick tell them how how bison are so important to the to the landscape? Yeah, I'll try to do my best. So um, basically our uh, prairies evolved with grazing. They evolved with bison and elk and deer and many other species out there grazing on the grass. And the grasses need that grazing in order to help them develop and not become too decadent, not have too much grass that just withers and leaves too much what we call thatch on the ground. So you don't have enough openings, so to say, in the canopy of the grass. Um, also, the hoof action of the bison can help disturb the soil so that new seeds can come in and sprout. Um, bison are also really unique as keystone species in that they would wallow, and so they would roll over and rub their backs onto the ground, and that would create these divots in the prairie that would fill in with water when we had rain, and those would become little refugia or like hot spots, so to say, for frogs and tadpoles and birds that needed that water to come to. Um, they would, you know, buffalo also would carry seeds when they would do that in their meat, in their um, fur, and they would pass that along their hair. And birds so do that quite often with like bird, but sometimes they have furs. I know they're not good. Yeah, but um, we still yeah. pick up all kinds of things. I know, I know. I could, I could ask you this forever, but now I'm like, okay, now I got to get her back. So now <laughs> tell us about how you, how Nature Conservancy manages the herd. Like, what do you guys yeah. do? What is your mission for that and stuff? So uh, um, again, we wanted to restore our prairies and, and in many ways, cattle and other livestock continue to play some of those roles, but we also wanted to see the native grazer return to those native prairies that we were managing. And so we, on those 12 preserves that I mentioned, have brought bas bison back onto the landscape and are managing them to help that restoration process. Um, I mentioned earlier that we also manage with fire. So uh, what we were able to learn through our management is how important also fire is to the landscape in that same way. There's actually, uh, just like Donna was talking about that people have been managing bison for thousands and thousands of years. A lot of that historic management was done by indigenous communities using fire. And so fire was lit to the prairie, it would burn off some of that old material and then new green growth would come in and it would just be a magnet to all of these prairie species to come and chew on that fresh green grass. And you can still see that today, especially on National Park Service lands and um, Nature Conservancy preserves. If you follow in the spring when we're doing some of our burns, you can see them coming in and 
glomming onto that green grass. It's really beautiful. You are a mind reader. Um, we had one of our, our question was a talk, to talk about prescribed ferns and how prescribed ferns and maybe who uses them. So if you guys out there know of anyone who uses them, if you want to like raise your hand, but now we know that Nature Conservancy does, <laughs> state parks, they all use prescribed ferns at some point or another when it's, okay, awesome. Sorry, I just, I just wanted to interject that. So the oh. question or didn't think they were ignored. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that's one of the ways that we also help to move bison across and around on our preserves. Uh, we do, with the nature concerns, we tend to move our animals more with fire than with fences. That said, all of our preserves are fenced because we want to keep them on, on our properties rather than roaming at large within the neighborhood. And so um, we do have to, in today's world right we have property laws we have the reality that these lands that the nature conservancy manages they are private lands and we do manage them as private land owners and so um we fence our lands we manage our bison to make sure that once you fence them in um there is only so much grass inside of those fences as we were talking about before and so we need to be respectful managers and make sure that we're taking good care of the animals and that those animals have enough grass to eat and so at some point we do get to a number of animals that um, we can't have enough grass to keep growing that herd and then we do have to make calling decisions um, as has been described and very similar to what Donald was describing we try to stay as natural as possible and so we often will even have uh, we'll have computers generate us a random selection of animals so that we don't have our managers making any biased decisions on which animals go oh. but they will go in with a list and say okay these are the animals that we need to pull out um, we do try to keep as close as we can to a one-to-one -one male to female ratio um, that's very challenging as donald was describing because of the amount of space that those bulls will need and um, other safety and challenges that go along with that and so we do end up typically on many of our herds around a three to one ratio. So three females to one male um, is fairly common. Some are at a two to one ratio. And uh, so we do end up culling typically in the fall when we do our roundups. Um, and that's when we will pull out a certain number of animals to make sure that we are managing for the amount of resource we have. I, do I have one more second to Alana? Um, you have one more second. Go, yes. We wanted to quick talk as well about um, a partnership that we've been working on with Wing Cave National Park because I think it kind of plays into some of these same questions. Uh, folks know about the Yellowstone herd as a really important genetic herd, um, but there are many herds that have a unique set of genetic traits. Donald and the Southern herd, as he was talking about before, um, and all of those animals like Dave was describing we had 50 million or so bison at one point and that was shrunk down to just 750 animals and so every every diverse buffalo trait we have today comes from that small group and it's really important that we maintain as much of that diversity as we can. Wind Cave is another herd that has a high set of genetic traits that are unique only to that herd um, but Wind Cave as a national park can only have about 500 animals given the amount of grass that they have. Geneticists recommend having at least a thousand breeding animals to make sure you don't have loss of genetic traits over time with inbreeding or um, just general fallout. And so we, the Nature Conservancy, began a partnership with Wind Cave about 2005, where we now have um, five of our herds at the Nature Conservancy are exclusively Wind Cave animals. And so uh, we have received animals from Wing Cave and we have what we call satellite herds. And so today we actually have more animals with Wing Cave genetics outside of the park than are inside of the park. And our goal is to operate as one big unit um, to look at how we can all work together to conserve those unique traits. That's great. I think I mean, that you just, yeah, it does. And you gave me another topic because that, that's a really good topic for the future. So um, now, now you know why you're coming back when we ask you. Again. <laughs> so, okay, Megan, I saved you for last because I believe that you're the most, you're pretty much the most complex. And then if we have time, we're gonna swing back over. Yes, you are. We're gonna swing back over to Dave, who is a little bit as complex. And then I think Brendan's got a, a, something to tell us possibly. 
But okay, so I wrote this question down because I don't want to screw it up. So the ITBC serves many tribes we talked about with herds of various types and sizes. And so what we're assuming here is there, there's no one size fits all answer to, to the questions that we've asked everybody else um, in terms of like, how do you manage? Is it like livestock? Is it like wildlife? You know, how do you determine carrying capacity? So can you just speak more broadly about like how, how tribes or how the, your partner tribes might differ in that and this, the mutual, the decisions that all have to be made? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's such a good question. And um, one of the things that's really unique about Intertribal Buffalo Council is we, we basically support and have a membership of 69 sovereign nations within the boundaries of the US. So, and actually one more, we just voted in um, one, uh, another member this year, um, which is really exciting. So the organization's always growing. Um, so we're working with 69 sovereign nations and although the whole mission of the organization revolves around restoring the Buffalo for spiritual and cultural purposes, um, ITVC, for example, doesn't distinguish between managing them as livestock and wildlife. Um, just because many different communities, tribes, nations relate to um, the Buffalo, you know, maybe through substance, through culture, through, um, you know, wildlife and ecological purposes and, and restoring prairie like Chris was talking about. Um, it doesn't <clears throat> mean that they have to be in one, you know, one sort of box like these are livestock, these are wildlife, these are um, a cultural resource or a, a sub subsistence resource. Um, so same way that like deer can be hunted and, and managed as wildlife and still eaten and used as a, a food source for people that's very similar of course, with Buffalo. Um, so we work to support, the organization supports these 69 or 70 sovereign nations um, and, and really respect and support their sovereignty in the different management strategies that they, they want to use to restore Buffalo to their lands, um, which can vary so widely. Um, you know, there's also varying resources on tribal lands as well. So a lot of those management decisions actually relate to you know, what kind of grass do they have all year, year long? Um, what's the land base? Is there, you know, wide open prairie like you see here with the Blackfeet Nation in Montana in the picture? Um, or is it, you know, one of the Pueblos down in New Mexico that has a totally different landscape that they're working with? So uh, actually we even have a, a buffalo herd um, managed by one of our member tribes up in Alaska, and that's on one of the islands in the Kodiak Island chain. So that's the Aleutic tribe of Old Harbor and they have an awful page. If you want to see Buffalo being like monitored by helicopter and transported on barges, it's really cool. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So varying resources has a lot to play in, in how management strategies differ as well. And we do our best to support them um, in all of those different ways. So one of the ways that ITBC supports our, our nations is by securing funding. Um, so we basically administer a grant through the federal government, um, federal funds that are directed uh, directly towards our member tribes to support herd development. So that could go to like fencing or corrals or veterinary care, supplemental feed. Um, and we, we're actually working on a bill right now. I have to put a little plug for the Indian Buffalo Management Act that uh, would make a permanent kind of obligation for the federal government to support buffalo restoration on tribal lands mm -hmm. for all of those purposes, not just um, you know, commercial or wildlife or ecological restoration. And it's all of those things managed by the sovereign nations that we work with. Um, so, you know, Don, you mentioned those two perspectives before about ranching and, and also managing as a park, park manager. Um, ITBC and its member member tribes and all the herd managers that we work with are really experts in managing under a multitude of different perspectives. So that's something that's really exciting. You know, I'm always learning about it. Um, and I encourage you to check out ITBC's website and read about some of our member tribes and some of their perspectives on how they manage their herds as well. Um, so the other thing we talked about earlier is carrying capacity. Um, ITBC member, member tribes have um, managed about 32 million acres of lands across the US. 
So that's about half of all the tribal lands um, designated in, within the boundaries of the United States. Um, and it's enormous potential really for developing habitat for buffalo herds. Um, they're, they're absolutely keystone species and um, every, I think uh, it was actually Wes Olson gave a great presentation at the American Bison Society meeting earlier at last, or later last year. And he, you know, just uh, talked about the point that every single buffalo on the landscape is really important. So um, ITBC and its membership have a huge opportunity to keep developing and supporting habitat for buffalo. And one of the most exciting things going on with that right now relates to the Yellowstone um, buffalo herd that we started talking about. Um, ITBC runs a surplus buffalo program that we basically work with the parks, um, wildlife refuges, private donors, um, other nonprofit agencies. And if they kind of reach their carrying capacities of animals, they can turn to ITBC as a resource for helping to place um, buffalo that are surplus to whatever those lands can support um, and move them to tribal lands to tribes that want to support uh, develop new herds or um, supplement their current herds. So through that buffalo surplus program, um, we are working directly with the Fort Peck tribe and we will be placing about 40 buffalo from Yellowstone onto tribal lands in um, July this year, July or August this year. And it's really, really exciting because ITBC has been involved with this process, as, as Brendan mentioned, um, for about 30 years now since, since uh, ITBC really was in existence. They put forward the first proposal to quarantine yellow, healthy Yellowstone buffalo um, in 1994 with the, the Choctaw Nation and um, Fort Belknap. So it's been a really long process in the making about 30 years in the making, and we're gonna see the first transfer of Yellowstone Buffalo to um, tribal lands through ITBC surplus program this year. So all these partnerships and, um, you know, really long hard work uh, that native organizations and native people have been doing to preserve and, and restore Buffalo out there are just uh, something, something that, you know, you don't hear a ton about in the news or anything, but it's just so massive and, and uh, you can kind of look for the, the news reports this year that a bunch of buffalo will be transferred from Yellowstone, um, Fort Peck, and then to tribal lands. And hopefully it's the beginning of a really successful program there that helps relieve some of that pressure. So we're really going to have partnerships with all these agencies and commercial producers and nonprofits that you know support all that. And uh, it's really, really exciting. Thanks. Colin. Yeah, that is great. Thank you so much. We are we are super running out of time. I probably didn't do a great job at um, monitoring things here, but I was so interested in what everyone had to say. I wanted to roll around to Dave, but I'm not sure if we're going to have time. But what I wanted to wrap up with is just this idea that um, each of you seems to have to each of the herds that you represent or the um, with Dave and Megan, they represent different uh, producers or different herds. You all have to address the same questions when thinking about the animal. And I think two um, ideas are paramount to me is that most of the, most of the uh, questions you have to address seem to do with the um, environment. So bison are healthy for the environment. The environment is healthy for bison, you know, and we humans are part of that environment. And then um, the other thing is restoration. You know, we all want there to be more bison. And in order to do that, you know, they're good for the land. They're good for us. They're good. And I, I see this um, sort of circle back to when we were talking about prescribed burning. Um, as long as humans have been around and bison have been around, they've been managing them. And there seems to be now this whole idea, you know, I tell kids um, that come to the museum that um, bison used to be the Walmart, you know, and I think there's this movement towards trying to use every part of the bison again. Um, Dave, just real quick, like 30 seconds, can you, do you have anything to add to that in terms of how you see producers addressing the same questions or um, is there anything we missed? Well, no, but I just want to uh, kind of tag on to what uh, Donald and Carissa were saying, and, and Megan and and uh, Brendan as well. But 
you know, when you think about bison in the, in the environment, and, and Carissa did a great job of talking about that relationship between the animal and the land, but the thing that, uh, you know, we also need to add in there is that the grasslands in North America are our version of the rainforest. Um, those grasses are incredibly important at capturing carbon and putting it back into the soil. University of California Davis actually says that the grasslands are a more resilient carbon trap than forests. And those grasslands have to have a gardener. And the bison are the gardeners out there that take care of the, of the grasslands. Um, Donald mentioned the conservation management plan. I think that's really a demonstration of the commitment that private producers are making to, um, to make, you know, monitoring and improving that. And we actually have that on a uh, mobile app now that was developed with the assistance of risk management agency that our conservation management plan, people can go out in the, the field and use it. You know, the, the uh, memorandum of understanding with the Intertribal Buffalo Council and the NBA is, you know, a demonstration of our common commitment to restore bison in the proper way, whether it's on private or tribal lands. And again, working with the, with the you know, uh, Fish and Wildlife and National Park Service is, yes, we all come at it from a different perspective, but at the heart of it is this incredible, magnificent animal that we all love. And we all consider that we want to be good stewards of this animal. Absolutely. I can't imagine ending any better way, except for, to, except for Brendan said he had some news that he might want to share. Maybe you still want to do that, Brendan? Sure, I'll just mention that um, uh, kind of in the spirit of this whole conversation, and, and Dave just did an exceptional job of really wrapping up and, and commenting on the importance of partnership. Um, and this panel has been excellent because we've touched on everything from uh, the importance of, 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 uh, of conserving this animal as a species from a, a genetic perspective, all the way to the ecological function that this species has um, uh, in its native habitats. Um, great discussion on the on this uh, uh, really truly unique and incomparable uh, connection between bison and cultural identity, uh, history, all that sort of thing. Um, and so, what I what I would encourage is folks to keep an eye out um, in the news over the next couple of days. In, in a couple hours here, the Secretary of the Interior is going to be announcing a new Department of Interior Bison Conservation Initiative. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I've been uh, chairing the, the working group that developed this over the last, uh, say, six months or so. And you'll, you'll see when that's unveiled today that there are a number of actions and goals that are going to direct Department of Interior over the next 10 years. I will say that uh, two, two things I'll mention. One is that um, the difference, the, 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 not so much a shift, but the development in this new initiative is that um, we're taking an approach that goes far beyond um, what we have been doing the last 10 or 12 years, which has been largely a focus on the genetic conservation end of things. And, and that will remain a priority for us. Um, but we're also moving forward to, to very explicitly recognize and engage in bison conservation for ecological and cultural restoration. And it touches on all these partners that you've, that you've had involved in this panel today. Um, and in particular, there are two actions that are going to occur in 2020 that are, are emblematic or, or demonstrative of the commitment that Department of Interior is making. One is going to be an internal action, which is going to be a, um, a move for genetic conservation for animals from the National Wildlife Refuge System, the herd at the Rocky Mountain Arsenal outside Denver, moving some animals into Theodore Roosevelt National Park. So moving across agencies, which, which hasn't really occurred um, much at all mm -hmm. in an intentional way. And, and those animals that move are gonna be folded into a research project at Theodore Roosevelt to evaluate um, how effectively bison that are moved into herds for, for genetic augmentation, how well do they actually integrate into an existing herd? Because they have really complex social systems um, that, that we're just starting to understand and learn about. So that's one action. The second action that is gonna be a really, uh, I think incredibly meaningful one, is that the Department of Interior is committing to send um, over the next five years, hundreds of bison from national parks and the National Wildlife Refuge herds to establish a new tribal herd in South Dakota 
at the Rosebud Sioux Reservation. And this is gonna be called the Wolakota Buffalo Range. It's a herd that's being established to, um, to accomplish a number of objectives ranging from economic development and food security all the way to education and ecological restoration. So um, again, that'll all be uh, announced shortly here officially. And um, just to echo Dave's points and those of all the other panelists, given the complexity and the really unique iconic status of this incredible animal, partnerships are so key to accomplishing all of our objectives. There's nothing um, exclusive about the different conservation or private production interests that we've talked about today. Um, we can all have a piece in that and we all frankly need each other in order to, um, to really do, uh, to right, do right by conservation and, and restoration goal. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna steal a line from Dave Carter at every uh, conference I attend. He always talks about, um, he talks about partnerships. I think usually with the ITBC, he says something like there's 80% we agree upon, or maybe Mike Faith had said this, there's 80% we agree upon about this animal and 20% we don't. Let's focus on the 80% and keep building those partnerships. I think that's awesome. Um, I have to end because people will probably start leaving because I promised an hour. So thank you so much to all of you. This has been more than a great conversation. Um, I'm so glad you're able to share your knowledge with our viewers today and me. And to the viewers, thank you so much for joining us. Um, again, we have to plug. We know times are hard for a lot of people. If you have it in your heart to give us some money. You can go on our website. If you want something in return, shop on our store. Um, Rachel's putting all the links in the chat window. Um, if you wanna keep up with what we're doing, uh, follow us on Facebook and Instagram. You can go to our website and join our um, email list and we'll send you all of our communications. Um, again, one, once more, we are gonna do this in two more weeks. Um, the next discussion is going to be May 21st um, at 10 a.m. And we're calling that discussion, um, I think it's really appropriate for the time, it's going to be bison babies all about calves. So um, if you want to know about those little red cinnamon bison babies, we're going to tell you all about them. Um, we're going to be talking about the birth and the life cycle of calves. We'll have with us Chad Kramer. He's the owner of um, Kramer Buffalo Company, and he's also the bison herd manager at Custer State Park. Um, super knowledgeable. I've seen him working with calves, and um, he'll have a lot of good things to say. We also, and I think he might be here with us now. I think I saw him. We're going to have um, Vic Gehring. He's the owner of Black Kettle Buffalo in Mound Ridge, Kansas. He's also the chairman of the board for the National Bison Association, I believe, right? Chairman of the board this year. Right. And um, he's on the National Buffalo Museum's Board of Directors as well. So um, he, he'll have a lot to share. Thank you guys. I don't know what else to say. If, if anyone wants to say anything else before we leave, go ahead. And if people are still here, they can, they can hang out or not. <laughs> well, I just want to say thanks. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having Lana. us out here. Yeah. Thank it's you. been an awesome time. Thank you. Time. I think we need to do part two. This was really good. <laughs> you bet. Thank you so Count much. me in. Okay, All great. Right. Yep. Sounds great. Thanks, Alana. Mm -hmm. Take care. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.